When you call the hotline, the call taker will ask you for several things, including the victim's name, date of birth, and address, if known. They'll also ask for the name of the suspected abuser and for a location where they can find the victim. Now, obviously, you're not always going to have everything on this list, and that's okay. You're not expected to have all of the answers. Just tell social services what you know. When giving your report to social services, you'll be asked for your own name and contact information. Now don't worry, social services is required by law to keep your name and personal information confidential. When speaking with a hotline worker, you'll obviously be asked to report your physical findings, but also be prepared to answer questions pertaining to the victim's state of mind. Social services will want to know everything they can about how the victim has been affected psychologically and emotionally or physically by the abuse. One thing that may come as a surprise to you is that mandated reporters are also required to report any information they receive from a third party. So even when the information comes from another person, whether it be a neighbor, a grandparent, or even another child, we need to relay that information onto social services. Right now you're probably saying, wait a sec, that's hearsay. And you're right, it is. But think of it like this. You and I are simply the middleman, a conduit, passing information on to social services. That's all we are in this process. What social services workers do with that information is out of our scope of practice. All you and I are doing is letting social services know what we, as mandatory reporters, have been told or what we've observed. I'm sure you've already asked why do social services need my phone number and other personal contact information. One very practical reason for this can occur when you have called the hotline sometime near the end of your shift and after going home, social services needs to get in touch with you, maybe to ask a few more questions. Sometimes the follow-up information they need can be time sensitive. And if you're at all nervous about giving out your information, remember all of your personal information is kept confidential by law. Mandated reporters information is held confidential. A mandated reporter may not make an anonymous report to the hotline. However, their name and personally identifiable information will be held as confidential. In the state of Missouri v. Tucker, the Missouri Supreme Court ruled that the Children's Division may not be court-ordered to release the identity of reporters. Those appropriate federal, state, or local government agencies with a need for such information in order to carry out its responsibilities under the law to protect children from child abuse or neglect may have access. The reporter's information is not released to parents, alleged perpetrators, children, or other family members. To ensure social services is able to act as quickly as possible to address cases of suspected abuse and neglect, we need to call the hotline as soon as we are able. Now, the longer the delay, the harder it may be for them to locate the people involved, including the victim, the perpetrator, and any witnesses. And waiting too long may also give perpetrators time to cover their tracks, concealing evidence of their own actions. I know what you're thinking. We don't always have time to drop what we're doing and make a phone call. I get that. And the people at social services understand that, too. In the setting of an emergency or when someone needs to be transported to the hospital, you won't be able to call the hotline from the scene. You may have to wait until after you've delivered the patient to an ER. Just make the call as soon as you can. What if a police officer or a nurse tells you that they're going to call social services? Do you still need to call them too? The short answer is yes. Remember that the requirement to report abuse and neglect is an individual responsibility. I asked Social Services Manager Danielle McCartney this very question, and this is what she had to say. She said, don't assume that any other agency will make the call. They may have the same assumption about you, or they might forget to make the call altogether. Then no one has made the call. 
EMS personnel are mandated reporters, and if our agency receives more than one report on the same person, that's all right. It's better than not receiving any call at all. It is SCAD's position that any employee who suspects abuse or neglect call the hotline personally every time and regardless of whether another representative from a different agency plans to do the same. The threat to the victim is just too great and for you and I the potential legal ramifications of failing to report, all of it's just not worth the risk. If my partner calls social services, do I need to call as well? No, actually this is one of the few exceptions to the individual reporting requirement. As long as one of you in the crew has made the call, that will suffice. And what about your battalion chief? Can they make the call for you? They can, but only in situations where he or she has also witnessed the evidence of the abuse and neglect firsthand. HIPAA is always a concern for healthcare professionals. However, cases of abuse and neglect are an exception to the usual rules. The safety of the victim far outweighs the need for someone's privacy. Failing to report abuse and neglect in the state of Missouri is a Class A misdemeanor offense, punishable by up to one year in jail and or a $1,000 fine. You know what else is a Class A misdemeanor? Being an abuser. That's right. Failing to report a case of abuse is just as bad as actually abusing someone. I'm willing to bet that a lot of you watching this video right now have had this one question cross your mind at least once today. What if I'm wrong? What if nobody is actually being abused or neglected? I don't want to get somebody in trouble who's not done anything wrong. Listen, first off, no one is going to jail or having their kids taken away just because you made a phone call. There has to be quite a bit more evidence than that. Your call simply gets the process started, giving social services the heads up that they need to check something out. You could be wrong, but what if you're right? Err on the side of the suspected victim. And even if it turns out that no one is outright abusing or neglecting a child, an elderly adult, or a disabled person, calling the hotline may very well be helpful still. Social services does a whole lot more than just put people in jail and take their kids away. Many times people are simply down on their luck and need help. A mother may not be trying to neglect her children. Instead, maybe she just can't afford to pay her bills and that's why. Her children are malnourished, have poor hygiene, and can't afford to keep the heat on in the dead of winter. In these situations, it's okay to call the hotline. In fact, that's exactly what you should do for these families. Social services isn't just some big, bad, child abuse watchdog prowling around looking for someone to punish. Their mission is to support and protect families, and oftentimes, their course of action will be to connect people in need with community-based resources, getting them the help they so desperately need. Here's another important thing to remember about making the decision to call the hotline. According to the law, as long as you are making a report in good faith, meaning you aren't outright lying and intentionally filing a false report because you just don't like somebody, the law gives all mandated reporters immunity from any liability, civil or criminal. In other words, even if you're wrong and the suspected abuser turns out to be completely innocent, you're not going to be penalized. Remember, you don't have to have conclusive proof and you don't even have to be right. All you need is a reasonable suspicion. So here's the bottom line. If you're ever unsure as to whether or not you should contact social services, do it. The fact that the thought has even crossed your mind is likely to be reason enough. That last time I called the hotline, nothing happened. The victim and the abuser still live under the same roof. So why should I even bother calling the hotline if they're not going to do anything about it anyway? Ever heard that one before? I have. 
Remember when I said that no one is going to jail or having their kids taken away just because you made a simple phone call? That's kind of reassuring when you're worried about accidentally getting some innocent person in trouble. But it's also a catch-22. The same guidelines that help to prevent innocent people from having to pay for crimes they didn't commit can also impact social services' ability to get involved when someone really is guilty. From our perspective, it can appear that the bad guy is getting away scot-free, and that can be incredibly frustrating. But here's the deal. When social services deems a report unsubstantiated, it doesn't mean they have decided that the alleged abuser is innocent. It just means that they couldn't prove a preponderance of the evidence to the level the law requires of them before they can get involved. But that brings up another important point. Social services and law enforcement do not play by the same set of rules. This means that even if social services is forced to deem a report unsubstantiated, law enforcement and prosecutors can still investigate and press charges when they have enough evidence to satisfy their own requirements. So while you still have to call the hotline, it might also be a good idea to notify law enforcement as well. Even when you think social services won't be able to help in a given situation, please call the hotline anyway. All of the information they receive is kept in a central registry system available for future use as background information or in establishing a pattern should another report be made by someone else down the road. Every report you make is valuable and could make a very real difference for someone suffering abuse and neglect. It just might not be a difference made today. From non-emergency cases of child abuse and neglect, there's also a way to make a report online. Now, I need to stress this system is only to be used when the victim is less than 18 years of age and only in non-emergency cases. For your convenience, you can easily access the online reporting website by going to the SCAD employee login page and clicking the link shown here. After receiving your report, social services may be able to perform a family assessment or conduct an investigation. In a family assessment, social services caseworkers will meet with the alleged victim and the victim's caretakers to assist in assessing for the risk of abuse and neglect and to determine what community-based resources or services might be able to help reduce the risk of abuse and neglect and support the family as a whole. By contrast, an investigation involves the actual collecting of evidence to determine if the victim has in fact been abused or neglected. Which route social services will take depends a lot on a number of factors including what information that they glean from your report. For example, if you suspect child abuse has already taken place, social services will most likely choose to conduct an investigation. On the other hand, if you call the hotline to report your concerns that a child is at risk of being harmed in some way due to unsafe living conditions, for example, then social services may decide that a family assessment is more appropriate. In either case, your report truly does have an impact, so it is important to be as precise and objective in your report as possible. There is at least one other time when you'll need to call the hotline in cases of child abandonment. It may come as a shock, but the law actually does allow parents to leave their infant children with any on-duty employee at a hospital, fire department, or with an emergency medical professional or law enforcement agency in Missouri without incurring criminal charges of child abandonment. This applies only when the child is one year old or younger. SCAD Policy 6 provides instructions for handling these occurrences. Among these is the requirement to call the hotline. By law, we are all mandated reporters. But let me ask you something. 
even if you weren't legally required to make a report of child abuse and neglect, wouldn't you want to do it anyway? For additional resources, go to the mandated reporter file in documents and forms on the SCAD website. Thank you for watching and good luck on the quiz. Take care.